Good morning, everyone, and welcome to NIFA's webinar Wednesday. Today, we are celebrating 20 years of NIFA's CRANE program. And I want to start off by thanking Legacy Bank and Trust, who is one of our sponsors um, for this series. And then I want to introduce you to some very special people who you're going to hear from today. Um, with us today is Sarah Takoda, who is the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Manager for NIFA. Um, in this position, she oversees the allocation process for NIFA. And prior to joining us at NIFA, um, she was the Executive Director of the Nebraska Housing Developers Association. She's worked in the affordable housing industry for over 20 years and um, previously also worked at the Nebraska Department of Economic Development and Perry Reed Properties. Um, and then we also have Kendra Dean with us. Um, Kendra is the operations manager of Cirrus House Incorporated, where she has worked for the last 31 years. Um, she has 21 years experience of managing their housing first model. And she um, oversees Cirrus House, which owns and manages 84 supported housing units for persons with severe and persistent mental illness. And then we also have Joel Doherty, who is the Chief Operating Officer with One World Community Health Centers. Um, One World Health Centers is a federally qualified health center that is in Omaha, Nebraska. And um, they own and operate 134 tax credit units that were developed under the Crane Program. Um, Joel has been with One World since 2005 and has been the Chief Operating Officer since 2007. Um, and I guess I neglected to say I'm Robin Ambrose. Um, I am the Deputy Director of Programs and Marketing at NIFA. And um, I just want to welcome you all. And I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to first talk about the Crane Program. Good morning. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It's exciting to uh, know that we have hit a 20 year mark for Crane. So I'm going to just share a little bit uh, an overview uh, regarding uh, what CRANE is. And CRANE actually stands, it's, it stands for Collaborative Resource Allocation for Nebraska. And the CRANE, um, the CRANE process was designed to be a strategic alliance between NIFA and other agencies um, to really form a partnership between communities, nonprofits, um, different uh, NIFA, other, other uh, agencies such as the Department of Economic Development, USDA, any, any uh, funding sources that could come together and really join on a project. A little bit of history on Crane to start out is that it actually began in April of 2001 and um, the first project you'll actually hear from uh, Kendra Dean here shortly. And that was actually the very first project that went through Crane. Crane has produced um, a little over 2,800 units. Um, 65 projects have received uh, reservations for tax credits. And then you can see approximately 31.5 million in low income housing tax credits and then in 2017, we were um, able to add the state housing tax credit. So there was $8.3 million in the state um, housing tax credit for crane projects thus far. Again, um, the whole idea behind crane is collaboration. Um, you'll hear a lot um, that um, if you attend any of our public meetings now that um, the Nebraska Department of Economic Development, NIFA and nonprofits work together um, through projects. Um, really the objective was to shorten the distance between resources and the public so that we could really increase the value of the resources. The crane process really allows us to be more, um, more of a, a strategic plan and goal oriented rather than being project driven. Whoa. There we go. So strategies and goals um, 
behind the CRANE program, um, one of the strategies was to allow for creative thinking. Uh, the CRANE developments are not scored competitively per se. Um, so there is, there is a minimum points that you must score and the application must meet the QAP. However, again, it's, it's not a competitive process. So you're able to really think creatively outside the box. Um, the one of the strategies is really to lower barriers for difficult to develop projects. Many of these projects have many layers of funding um, or they just may be extremely challenging um, projects to develop based on either where they're being developed, the type of services that need to be surrounding um, the clients and things like that. Again, um, we, I'm saying it a lot, but it's really to increase the value of collaborative resources. Again, that collaboration is the key word here. And then it's to create a more efficient allocation process so that um, they're not having to work in a competitive in a competitive world, it is you know there's a deadline for this resource, a deadline for this resource. But with Crane, it's easier to just look, kind of work through the process so that you're able to hit each of those deadlines. Um, and in the case of the Nebraska Department of Economic Development and NIFA, we share an application process. So that's one large step if you're interested in um, home funds or housing trust funds. Um, it really eliminates having to do multiple applications. So the ultimate goals um, really behind the program is to um, have housing development, obviously, right? We wanna, we wanna develop units for, for folks to live in in the end, right? So that's a big thing. But again, it's, it's not just about housing. It's about the community development strategies. It's, it's the community being involved with the process, implementation of maybe plans that are already in place um, in different Nebraska communities. Obviously, every community is so different. What's needed in Grand Island is different than what's needed in Scotts Bluff, which is different than what's needed in Lincoln. So it really, uh, it's community driven. And then the final piece is really to make sure that there is that um, view of, of the job creation and enhancement that's coming out of that, that um, the construction and the project being built in, in that community. So there are a lot of components, but some, some, some key components are, again, applicants must join with cities, communities, neighborhoods. It must be truly a public process um, that, that assesses the needs of each community. Um, I mean, we, we require a market study on all of our projects to make sure that, that the project can be supported in the community. But this is a step further where it really shows the involvement and the need for each particular project in that community. And then of course we have to be provided a plan that shows the specific solutions and how this, this development is going to address those particular needs. One of the key parts of, of where we wanna show community involvement is that, and there must be evidence that at least 10% um, um, of the material services, cash contributions have to show that it's been, um, been done through community-based financing. So whether it's you know, donations or anything like that, it, it, you have to show that at least that 10%. And then another key piece of, of Crane is to show um, supportive services for the, the end occupants of the units. So making sure that they are provided um, the, the type of supportive services they need. Some examples of that would be um, some of the projects have, um, uh, have case managers that help coordinate different um, services for individuals. Um, some things it's it's as simple as having um, you know group activities, um, helping pay for for, for renters insurance, um, providing education opportunities or job training opportunities. So there's a lot of different supportive services, and those supportive services need to be geared towards the population that's being served. Then of course um, we have some some things that are are um, required based 
on all of our projects, but um, before they can receive conditional reservations, for example, um, site control, zoning, financing needs to be in place. Um, we need to know the timeline and, and the objectives be behind the project. And then finally, ultimately, any project that's developed through Crane has to comply with the qualified allocation plan, which is it, which is what guides our um, low income housing tax credit program. It spells about what each project has to have and how it has to be structured. So um, in the end, we have to make sure that each development meets um, those, those qualifications in the QAP. Now that isn't said that you have to worry about that on, on your own. That's one of the great things about Crane is that we are able to provide feedback um, and I'll go into that a little bit further. Um, Crane set aside, it, we actually do call it a set aside where we set aside 33% of our low income housing tax credit allocation annually to be put towards the development of Crane projects. So, you know, that's a little, it's a little around 1.4 million, sometimes a little more are the amount that we get in credits changes every year um, based on our population and, and um, some numbers published by um, by HUD. So, but it's usually around 1.4 million. But there, there are specific developments that are eligible for Crane. So um, I've listed them all out here, but I'll kind of elaborate a little bit on some of them. Um, housing for special populations. So we have seen this in many projects in regards to um, homeless, Homeless, serving homeless individuals, homeless veterans, those with disabilities, um, things like that. And again, that's where we talked about the supportive services and how then those supportive services would need to be targeted for those particular populations. Um, additionally, a, a, a project that is being developed on tribal land or developed by a tribe could, could qualify for Crane. Um, adaptive reuse of a non-residential building. Um, in the picture in the in the top right hand corner, that happened to be an old brewery that was um, in Hastings that was then turned into residential um, affordable housing. Um, another example is a recent one was a, a nursing home um, that is being uh, turned into completely gutted and turned into um, affordable housing. Um, housing in response to settle agreements, settlement agreements, we actually don't see that often, but um, if we have it there in case there ever would be any fair housing issues or settlement agreements, um, we would be able, those projects would be able to come into Crane. And then a new one we added um, recently was housing located in a county that has never had a low income housing tax credit development. So there are some rural counties that have never had a development um, and maybe the development um, would be difficult. Uh, it would have to be so small. It would be difficult to, um, to complete in our um, competitive rounds. So we um, at our, our board and we had a lot of support for introducing this as an option for Crane. Um, Re-entry housing is a new addition. Um, in regards to um, being crane eligible. And then natural disaster, uh, a development located in a natural presidentially declared natural disaster area. Um, the key for this is that it just can't be in an area that has had a natural disaster. It's important that there was a significant loss of housing as a result of that natural disaster. Um, and so those are, our, those are our crane eligible developments. So there are four categories um, of crane. And the first is the conceptual piece. Um, that's where you may have an idea, um, you have a populate, you know who you know enough about the project that you know who you're going to serve, how you're going to structure it basically. But you, you send an email to NIFA um, asking to be invited into the crane program, telling us a little bit about crane. Um, and then your next step was if if our we have a team that we share that information with, and if the team indicates um, decides that you are crane eligible and the project meets um, the crane requirements, then we invite you to fill out a 
crane application, which is a little more in depth. It asks for um, additional information about estimated costs, and um, there's there's a lot of information um, requested regarding how the project is again um, crane eligible. Um, the second category is it's in it's in formation. Um, you are uh, you're you're invited to complete an application. Um, and so you've been you've been able to you've been able to complete the full application, but you don't have all your threshold items and you don't have your um, you, you're not you're not quite there. So you're still working through with NIFA staff, DED staff, um, any any other staff, uh, any other funding sources to really get your project um, finalized and then feasible comes when you are, you're really, you're ready to, you're ready, you're almost there, you're moving forward, you've got almost all of your pieces in place, your full application has been submitted. Um, and then the final category is when you reach category four, it means that you're ready to proceed. So um, that would mean that your application meets all of the requirements in the qualified allocation plan um, and you're, you're ready to move forward. Now that can take as little as, uh, nine months um, if we have crane funds available and it can take as long as three years. It really depends on where you are in the process of the crane, uh, where you are in the, in the process of your development. And oftentimes it depends on um, the experience of the developer. That is just a little overview. Um, I've listed my contact information is on there. And then I also did include our compliance manager who I work with the allocation, which is the which is the um, the beginning of the project until it's built, and then our compliance manager works with everything um, in the long term compliance period. So there's our contact information, and you can always feel free to reach out to us with any questions. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I just want to remind everybody who's watching: if you have any questions, um, you can put them either in the Q and A. Um, or in the chat, and we will um, address all of those at the at the end. Um, next, we're going to hear from Kendra Dean, um, and this is very exciting because Kendra has um, the very first crane project. So, um, Kendra, we'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Robin. So, um, just tell you a little bit about Sears House, and then how we ended up um, actually being the first crane project. Sears House is a straight based clubhouse model program, which provides a restorative environment for persons who need support of others who are also in recovery and who believe mental illness is treatable. Um, housing is a core value of the clubhouse model programs. There are clubhouses um, all across the United States and Sears House has been a clubhouse since 1986. Uh, our clubhouse membership um, obviously has grown a lot and a reoccurring theme um, as we get more and more referrals is the need for housing. We need more housing in order to provide the kind of support systems our participating members need um, to live normal lives, productive lives. And in 1998, we partnered with our local CHODO, um, which is now known as the Housing Developers Association to look at some new construction ideas um, following one of our strategic planning sessions where we really did identify um, housing um, as, as a primary need for rehabilitation for the persons we were serving. At that time, the director of the CHODO traveled with me to other clubhouse model programs across the state or across the country. Um, specifically, we went to South Carolina, North Carolina to learn more about um, what was being developed and the kind of support services being offered to our special needs population. The trip inspired her and she actually was the one who assisted us with securing the first monies to start new construction. Uh, we, at that time, we received a commitment from uh, Federal Home Loan Bank of Topeka. That was in June of 1999. And that award was for $110,000. At that time, I wasn't aware, but I learned along the way that it was really unusual to get those funds um, and have those be the first monies into the project. 
Uh, so we continued to kind of work on things. It would um, be almost a year before any other awards came our way. Um, during this year, that Chodo director actually left and we kind of, Sears House was really struggling to figure out what our next move should be. For several months, um, I kind of hooked up with, with NIFA, learned about NIFA a little bit more. I worked and communicated with the NIFA staff and some other developers to learn more about the low income housing tax credit process. However, it didn't take us long to realize that we were gonna to struggle to compete for a tax credit award. We were looking to build um, 25 to 30 units, one bedroom, maybe five, 600 square feet. Um, the low number of units, the qualified development costs and the low tenant incomes were working against us. We're, we were being encouraged to consider building, changing our building plan, perhaps building more units, add an additional bedroom, build garages, carports, community rooms, et cetera. Sears House was really not prepared to build something that we didn't think fit our needs. Um, we really felt like we needed the smaller one bedroom units. We, uh, the population that we were serving were mostly uh, single adults. Um, we didn't wanna be forced into building something bigger than we could manage on our own. So the whole idea of new construction kind of stalled and we just, things, things kind of changed with our priorities and we kind of just put this on the back burner, um, knowing that we obviously wanted to proceed because we did have the commitment from federal, uh, from first, uh, the Federal Home Loan Bank of Topeka. Um, so one day out of the blue, Tim Kenny walks into my office in Scotts Bluff. He was in town talking to local bankers uh, he was aware of our funding search, um, the work that we'd done, and he was aware that we had a commitment from Federal Home Loan Bank of Topeka. He wanted to know more about our Sears House project and our housing program. So we gathered myself, some Sears House staff, Sears House participants, and tenants that were living in our housing at the time. At that time, we had 24 one bedroom units. And we shared with him our housing model um, that we were currently using. Our housing at that time offered and still does, still does offer an array of services for each of our tenants. Um, first was participation in our day program. We have a day program where our members can come every day and be involved in the work of the clubhouse. Um, they participate in um, paying our bills, um, monitoring the hours of, of units of service that we get um, for having them there. They um, do our shopping, they drive um, other members to and from doctor's appointments. They really do run the program. Um, it, it is their clubhouse. One of the things that we offer in our day program is employment opportunities. And at that time, our staff would go into the community and find entry level jobs for our members. Once we secured a position, the staff would train for that job. And the staff would then introduce our members to the employer and they would go through the hiring process. And then our staff would train the new employees. We would provide ongoing job coaching and supervision if needed. And because staff knew the job, we would guarantee the employer no absenteeism. This was a huge selling point for our employment program. This allowed our program participants, um, the employee, to rest assured that they would not lose their job during a mental health crisis or a medication change. Our approach to securing employment and managing our employment program has changed over the years, but employment is still an important part of our program. We also shared with him um, other aspects of our housing program, which really have not changed at all since that initial meeting with Tim. It is still managed by our tenants working together with our staff to accomplish independent housing success. At move in, we discuss with tenants about what struggles they may have encountered in their past living situations. And we discuss services we have available to help manage those struggles in a way that would assist them with, many, with maintaining their independent housing. <clears throat> tenants work with staff to set their own goals and services which fit their own needs. 
Um, we have advocates available to assist with um, some of the services would include advocates to assist with medical and legal appointments, uh, liaison between the physician and the tenant and, or the member, uh, education mentors, employment searches, meals, budgeting, assisting with social security disability applications, uh, housekeeping guidance, renters education, socialization, and other medication ma and medication management are just a few of the services that we offered then and continue to offer. Um, our tenants work as a unit to collect rents, complete monthly reports, maintain tenant files, pay bills related directly to property management, and they assist with on-site inspections. Um, the success of our housing program truly is um, our tenants being involved and um, in tune to um, what's going around in, in, in the community, in the, in the neighborhood where their housing is. Um, housing and employment are the cornerstone of our clubhouse program, and I believe Tim found that to be encouraging. Um, he was very impressed with the services that we were offering at the time. He was very impressed with um, how our tenants were actively involved in all of the management aspects of the housing that we were currently managing. <coughs> he left that day telling me, don't throw in the towel just yet. Um, he told me that he could see a real need. Um, this was the type of program that NIFA would want to be uh, involved with. Um, and NIFA wanted to be working within uh, community programs such as, such as ours. So um, we had never given up, but at that point we really felt a little bit more inspired and um, kind of jumped back on the bandwagon. And with a few, within a few weeks, uh, Becky Christofferson contacted me with the name of a housing consultant from Colorado who she thought um, we should talk to. I immediately reached out to affordable housing consultants from Denver, Colorado. This is a family owned business we found, uh, who found um, our program and our project right up their alley. They were all in from the beginning. Within a few months, NIFA staff reached out to tell us about Crane um, and they encouraged us to look at that funding. The, aspect of Crane and the collaboration and involving the community um, just fit well with Sears House and who we are. Um, we already had a really good re working relationship with the city of Scotts Bluff, um, with other um, nonprofits in the area. We worked closely with our continuum of care. Sears House had actually, um, was actually one of the founding members of our regional continuum of care. So we had, we had a lot of community partners and community resources that um, it really was going to mean that Sears South and Crane were gonna fit well together. So following those initial meetings or contacts with Becky and with um, Joe at the housing consultants um, from Denver, the first four months of, 20, of 2001 was like a whirlwind. We submitted um, four additional applications for funding um, already having the uh, Federal Home Loan Bank of Topeka money. And by June of 2001, we had commitments from all four, including what I believe to be the first Crane Award, which was committed, um, awarded to us in April of 2001. Financial par partners for this project included Nebraska Investment Finance Asso uh, Authority, Federal Home Loan Bank of Topeka, Nebraska Department of Economic Development, a local bank, Platte Valley National Bank, the city of Scotts Bluff, um, that was our tax increment finance loan. And then Sears House um, had a commitment of uh, $45,000, plus we took out a, a conventional loan and then Midwest Housing Equity Fund. Uh, the total project, uh, the total funds put into the project was $2,173,598. Uh, we constructed five buildings total. Uh, four of those buildings were apartments, which were approximately 550 square feet. And one building with 12 apartments, which was approximately 325 square feet. Um, that building also housed an apartment manager. The larger building would become more of a supported housing program offering on-site supports. The other four buildings were intended to be more independent and offered those 
in the more supported units um, a program to transition to when they were ready. At the time of the initial um, project, we did purchase enough land to be able to add additional housing um, if need be, and um, if the time was right and funding was available. Um, so since then, we um, have completed phase two and phase three of that project, um, both of which were constructed using Crane. So Sears House now owns um, a total of 84 one-bedroom supported housing apartments at 10 separate locations. We have, out of our 40, 84 units, I think we have 13 original tenants that um, are still with us. And um, a majority of the tenants that we have still participate and are active in our um, day program and or receive some type of other um, support services from us uh, as far as like being enrolled in a program. Those tenants that choose not to enroll in a program, you don't have to be obviously enrolled in a program to live in our housing, but they still, um, our housing unit, um, which is made up of staff and members are still available to do um, uh, all of the services that are available, um, whether or not you're enrolled in a, in a program. So um, that supported housing piece is just constantly there. And, and um, the tenants, I think, benefit a lot from knowing that it's their peers, their neighbors that are helping to make their housing successful. Um, that's all I really have. If somebody has questions about um, our program, I can't tell you much about the whole crane application because I hired an expert to do that, but um, I can sure share anything you want to know about the project itself. Great, thank you, Kendra. Uh, that's really fun to hear about how that project came to be and about all the history of that. So thank you for paving the way. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Joel. Um, Joel, I'll turn it over to you uh, to talk a little bit about uh, One World's crane project. Thank you very much, Robin. Uh, my name is Joel Doherty. I'm the Chief Operating Officer here at One World. And One World is a federally qualified health center uh, headquartered in South Omaha. And we serve uh, uh, all over Omaha, as well as uh, Bellevue and Plattsmouth, uh, Nebraska. We provide medical, dental, and behavioral health services. And about 10 years ago, maybe longer than that now, uh, One World wanted to branch out into uh, an area that was becoming more and more well-known called the social determinants of health and certainly uh, uh, safe, uh, healthy, affordable housing is an important component of that. And so uh, what you see in front of you uh, in the top left is One World's original uh, headquarters, uh, which was a house here in South Omaha. And then on the right, you see another uh, crane success story that New Style Development uh, undertook in uh, 2003 through 2005 um, to renovate the uh, historic livestock exchange building that was built in uh, the mid 1920s and turn it into 102, 102 units of one and two bedroom family uh, affordable housing. And the first three floors of that building, uh, then One World became uh, a tenant uh, taking 40,000 square feet in that building on the first floor. Uh, our, our mission is that in partnership with the community, we provide culturally respectful and quality healthcare with a special attention on the underserved. And so we, over the years, New Style did a good job of teaching us a little bit about the uh, low income housing tax credit process. They were very proud of the livestock building uh, and, and really had a desire at some point for One World to take that building over from them. Um, if we'll remember back to 2008 uh, and the economic uncertainty, as well as uh, additional uh, housing tax credits that were still available post Hurricane Katrina. Uh, we set out on a project uh, to take advantage of some of the stimulus funds to build new clinic space, but also uh, to increase the amount of affordable housing down here around our campus. And so 
we we dreamt up uh, two four story buildings uh, on campus, which is very much in the heart of the city and uh, land is at a premium. Uh, and we thought, OK, on the first two floors of each building, we'll build a clinic. And on the second two floors, we'll build affordable housing. Um, we very early in the process, uh, uh, Andrea, our CEO, and I met with uh, Tim and Ted, and uh, we had been connected with a developer, uh, Julie Stavniak and Jim Royer from J Development, who uh, also helped us try and just figure out how this might be possible. And uh, the NIFA team was, was excited about uh, being able to expand housing in this area. And so uh, we, we embarked forward on uh, 32 new uh, senior units. So on campus now we have 134 total units, uh, 102 of which are family and 32 of which are, are senior 55 and older. Uh, it also allowed us uh, space to uh, double our patient volume uh, and create 120 new permanent uh, good paying jobs here in, in 68107. This is a picture that I have in my office of, of the original building that I just love. And I love that, uh, it, you know, such a good partnership between uh, NIFA and, and uh, low income uh, tax credit developer and the city of Omaha and HUD uh, all came together to save this uh, building. Here is the rendering that we were uh, shopping around when we were looking uh, for ways to finance this. and. Uh, the Health Resources and Services Administration at the federal level is, is One World's uh, primary funding agency. We get in the form of a grant about 15% of our budget from them each year. But uh, in 2009, uh, there was some federal stimulus that allowed us to uh, apply for uh, and receive funding to build the clinic uh, part of this uh, development. And so the way the financing came together is that we got, uh, we applied for and received uh, $8.9 million from the Affordable Care Act. And then we were able to leverage the, the LIHTC credits that we got through the crane process, as well as some private donors and the city of Omaha to, to make this project come together. It's kind of a, this is the uh, after picture. So it is pretty close to the, uh, original uh, vision of the project itself. This is a as complicated a project as I think a person could start with in that uh, we were trying to use federal HRSA money uh, to build clinic space in a building that uh, the LIHTC syndicator uh, needed to, to own uh, as well. And so these actually are uh, when you what you're looking at there is five physical addresses. The first two floors of the four-story buildings are condoed and owned by the health clinic, and then the uh, third and fourth floors are owned by the uh, housing partnership with the uh, syndicator. Our syndicator is Meg, uh, as well as the clinic itself. So, uh, being able to uh, complete a project like this with the different moving parts on the financing and Really, we needed somebody to step up and say, uh, all right, we'll be the first one in to commit. Uh, if, if these other things come true, we can move forward. And, and NIFA was there uh, helping us along the way and, and really was the first one that said, OK, we'll put our, we'll put our uh, word down on paper so that you can show some of your other partners you have, uh, you have our backing and, and then we can move forward. So. Uh, what you're looking at here today, both the livestock building, but also the two smaller buildings that we call the Livestock Commons Project, uh, definitely would not have been possible without the participation of, of uh, NIFA, LIHTC, and specifically the crane uh, process. And uh, I am ha happy to uh, share that at the end of 2018, uh, we did complete the purchase of the uh, exchange building itself. So now, uh, One World uh, is able to say that we own uh, our entire headquarters and the campus around it. So uh, thank you very much. And, and uh, with everyone else, I'll be happy to entertain uh, questions uh, as we go. Stop sharing. Great. Thank you so much, Joel, for sharing that with us. Um, I do think one of the great things about Crane um, is that 
uh, for projects that maybe wouldn't have competed well in the competitive cycle for low income housing tax credits. Um, it's a great process. And um, can you just talk a little bit about if you're, you know, if you, if you feel like that added um, to the process for you, both you and Kendra, um, if that made it kind of a little bit it, it eased your mind that you, as you were going through that process that you had a little bit of extra um, a little bit of extra help and and time uh, so that you weren't competing and you know just going in with the application and, and only having that chance and if you didn't receive credits then you know trying again basically so sure I can speak from from one world's experience um, it, without kind of the the crane process I just don't think the project would have been possible I mean the the funding broke down to roughly a third uh, of the funding came from uh, LIHTC and, and two thirds came from the federal government in the form of a straight grant. And uh, the, if we would have had to, you know, those applications for the federal money come out with tight deadlines on them, um, it, it, there really wouldn't have been a possibility to compete uh, for low income tax credits or this. It just the, and and the way the way the feds work is they're not really big on gray area and so we couldn't say here's the project that we want to build but if this other funding doesn't come through we'll build this other scaled down project it's kind of an all or nothing we were also trying to prove how we were going to leverage the stimulus to have a greater impact in in the area and so uh tr truly uh the project just wouldn't have happened uh because of the uncertainty and the time involved in the regular process. Um, not that the regular process is untenable, but specifically for this kind of project, it just wouldn't have worked. Okay, great, thank you. Kendra, I don't know, I know your experience was a little bit different uh, being one of the first ones, but did you have anything to add to that? Well, um, yeah, and I mean, obviously I didn't have any knowledge of what tax credits even was, but I can tell you just from, like I said, I was in contact with people from NIFA for about a year and um, I, the, my housing consultant, you know, said the same thing is we were going to be serving, you know, very low income people. So, I mean, we weren't going to charge the typical rents that um, most projects would be able to charge. Um, we had to make sure we could get uh, uh, tenant based vouchers um, and you know, we just, we weren't, we weren't building a large enough project to um, just put the numbers together and make everything work. I mean, we, you know, it was very small scale. So, you know, I don't believe that, I mean, I, I truly believe that Crane was, um, you know, came around just at the right time. I think, I, I'm, I'm sure that there had to have been some things in the back of NIFA's mind you know, prior to us, but it just seemed like after Tim, you know, heard our story and, and um, the kind of project um, that we needed to build that our, our population asked for, I mean, they were in the room talking about it at the same time. I really feel that Crane, you know, just was, it was just meant for us. So. Yeah. yeah, great. Yeah. I also love that, um, you know, having watched crane projects go through the process, I think that um, it really can depend on, it's really up to you as, you know, the applicant, how quickly you can move. We've had ones that have come in and, you know, been ready to go in six months. And then we've had other ones that have gone through the process and taken maybe two years. And so at the end of the day though, um, you know, the, the projects are built and, and they can take as much time as they need to, to really put things together, so. And once we got phase one done, our phase two and our phase three did go really quickly. I mean, you know, we had, obviously we had the, the, the land and I mean, we pretty much had the blueprints and, you know, we had, we had people on board already. They'd seen how well phase one was working, which is a big deal when you're building this kind of project to be able to prove to the community that what you're building isn't gonna look is going to look good in their neighborhood? Is it, you know, it's going to um, be a benefit to the community? And, you know, you kind of have to prove yourself. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, Susan, do we have any other questions? 
I do not see any questions uh, in the background, but if anybody has any, please type them in and we'll hang on for just a moment or two more. Okay, while we're doing that, I'll just mention a few other things. Um, since this is the 20th year of Crane and we are celebrating that, um, keep an eye out for on our social media pages and um, on, on our um, email listserv, we're celebrating projects um, that have been done through the Crane process each month uh, through the end of the year. Um, and speaking of our listserv, I'll just mention we are currently updating to a new system. And so if you haven't um, already, please go out to our website at uh, nifa.org and sign up um, to receive NIFA news so you don't miss any anything coming from us. Um, I will also mention um, that um, our upcoming webinars um, are out on our website as well, and you can register for them in two weeks. Um, we'll be celebrating Homeownership Month um, with our homeownership team. And then on June 30th, um, we will be hearing about the Youth Build program. I don't see any additional questions, okay. Robin. So I think we've All right. had a great well, day. Yeah, with that, I'll give you guys back some time in your day then. And I just uh, thank you to all of our, our panelists today. Thank you for sharing um, your experience um, and a little bit about your projects. We really appreciate you. Um, I know Sarah had to jump off, but I will just say um, anyone who's watching, if you have questions, um, about the crane program or would like have a project in mind, uh, please don't hesitate to uh, reach out to Sarah and her team. And um, again, I want to thank Legacy Bank and Trust, uh, who is one of our sponsors, and um, just wish you all a, a great rest of the week and, and a good summer. So take care. <laughs>